found her there with the laboratory. We're doing experiments on, on houses and how they perform in, in extreme winds such as tornadoes and hurricanes. Aaron Jaffa is a, a civil engineering student who just finished his third year, and he's working on this project uh, to understand how roofs fail in, in, in tornadoes. So we have, in the, in, in the wind tunnel now, we have a uh, neighborhood of uh, typical suburban houses. This is pretty similar to in Angus, Ontario, where in June 2014, um, there was a tornado that damaged about 100 houses, and, and about a dozen of them lost their roofs. So we're trying to understand the wind speeds and, uh, and the performance of houses that uh, uh, under failure. Um, so it's kind of a, kind of a fun project. Uh, the houses are model to fail. Uh, we use actual fridge magnets to hold the roofs down, and, and it's all properly and scientifically scaled so we can understand uh, the actual forces that the wind causes uh, to cause failure. So it's before you were alive, but you probably you may or may not realize that in 1985, May of 85, there was a there were a swarm of tornadoes in Pennsylvania and Ohio that killed 40 people. Uh, if you drive up north towards uh, Allegheny National Forest, up through Penfield and towards St. Mary's, where you can get your straw beer, there used to be a whole swath of uh, forest that was just you know, toothpick uh, broken trees uh, from the the track of this tornado. I was living in Toronto at the time and I remember the skies going black and uh, it killed 40 people uh, in, in Ontario. And so there's two separate swarms at least. So this is a wind tunnel. Uh, you can see that the, it doesn't really look like a tornado to me, but it looks like high winds. It has no rotation in it. And I guess at the scale of this, it doesn't need to, but they're looking at the, uh, the roofs being blown off these houses. I don't know if you can see it, but there are little dots on the insides of those roofs, which apparently are uh, fridge magnets to be able to pr provide the right uh, scaling for um, the strength of the, uh, of the roof before it gets sucked off by, by the wind as it, it goes past. Um, so that's one. Um, this all keys into what we've talked about in terms of um, dimensional analysis, uh, which we'll kind of return to today, the idea that you can um, scale the behavior of a system in a wind tunnel to be able to use models that are geometrically similar to um, the system you want to represent, a town in this particular case, with a smokestack. And if you get the scaling right for the fluid part, which probably means Reynolds number, for uh, kinematic similitude, the right flow patterns, you can use it to make um, quantitative predictions of things like concentrations downstream, uh, lift on airfoils, etc. So a very, very powerful uh, technique uh, to use. And so we'll kind of finish that stuff off today uh, and move on to pipe flow, for which the same kinds of uh, uh, models can be used. might as well mute it. And so very clever models. Uh, I read an article the weekend on uh, Davenport's uh, wind tunnel. So Alan Davenport was a guy who worked at Western uh, University in London, Ontario, not so uh, six hours drive away from here, uh, which was kind of at one stage the preeminent uh, boundary layer wind tunnel. Now many exist to be able to do experiments on structures like this. And the idea is to be able to understand uh, exactly what the wind patterns would be, understand what the forces would be on such structures, because you want to build them quite uh, uh, light and thin, so you don't use too much material, so they're very flexible. And so you can also uh, analyze things like if you get the scaling right for the flow uh, system with the shedding of these vortex sheets off the back of this bridge deck to give it this impulse to make it vibrate, if you get the um, stiffness of the structure, just like a guitar string, right? The, the stiffness of a guitar string defines its note and its tension. So those mechanical properties of a guitar string are not so different to this bridge deck, not the, the, the supports on this uh, cable-stayed bridge. But if you get it right, you can also analyze the, the frequencies that the, uh, 
the, the bridge goes into. And so you can compare the frequencies that the wind would apply as an impulse to what the resonant frequency of the bridge is, and there's much more sophisticated ways to be able to figure that out by using numerical models to look at the stiffness of a bridge, um, structural models. But if you want it so that you don't match the resonant frequency of the bridge with the expected excitation from a given, uh, not very high velocity wind, but a constant velocity wind, which is exactly the, the behavior for the, uh, uh, the wreck the Tacoma Narrows. And so before Tacoma Narrows, it wasn't really uh, thought that this is a big problem, and obviously it was. And you've uh, certainly seen that likely in your, um, uh, in your physics classes uh, at, at school, I'm guessing, and maybe beyond, beyond that. Um, and so, yeah, so that's that. And so this uh, wind tunnel is quite well known. It's no longer quite as unique as it was, um, but it's been used to evaluate the behavior. Well, I've been on the Bronx, White, Whitestone Bridge, uh, going between airports um, in New York City. Confederation Bridge is the one that links Prince Edward Island and uh, New Brunswick, I guess, in Canada. And some, uh, yeah, I guess, and, and this footbridge at the bottom is a curved uh, plan view and a, a vertical arch support, which I guess is a, a quite an iconic uh, bridge. So that's kind of uh, a follow on, I guess, from what we had talked about in terms of the behaviors um, in dimensional analysis, albeit online. And uh, as, a, as a transition, um, we'll use dimensional analysis as a powerful tool. Uh, it really was the tool that was used to be able to talk about pipe flow. So now we're moving into the final three or four weeks of the, the class to look at um, the behavior of structure, so the recipe part. And the recipe part is to look at internal flows. What is the drag as you flow fluid down a pipe? External flows, what are the forces that are applied on wind turbine blades or on structures? And open channel flows, how quickly does fluid flow if you give a gradient to it in a, uh, a ditch or a canal or a, a flow channel, irrigation channel, for instance? Um, and the first way of us to be able to look at that maybe is to use dimensional analysis. And so, so that's kind of the, the introduction that we're giving here. So all that you're watching here is flow within a, um, a clear uh, pipe with a die being introduced uh, along the length of it. Uh, and what's happening is that the flow velocity is being increased from laminar flow, relatively low velocities. And as the flow velocity goes up, you start to see this ripple in the, uh, the die that's going down the length of the, the tube. And so in the same way that we talked in dimensional analysis, uh, we have to satisfy these three conditions. Geometric similitude, the system has to be scaled in the right way. The plane has to look like a plane in the model and the prototype. Um, kinematic similitude is that the flow patterns have to be the same. So if it's in real life in the prototype, it's flowing as laminar flow with no ripples in this or turbulent flow with ripples in it, then we have to represent that by doing the test at the right Reynolds number. And then we measure things in, in the structure. For instance, those things we could measure could be the moment that's put on the tower, on the, the bridge, just by measuring using strain gauges or stress gauges at the base of that, and getting that magnitude in the scaled model and scaling it through the Euler number to get the correct force that would be applied in the real, real structure. And so that is quite a sophisticated, actually it may sound kind of old school to you, but um, being able to represent the CN Tower, or actually the, in some of the documentation, the, the, two, the Twin Towers in New York, with all the buildings around it, to be able to understand what the effects of those subsidiary buildings are on the wind patterns that ultimately impact those new buildings that are going in, is not such an easy problem to solve um, numerically. You can do it with big models, but they end up being big models. The utility of using uh, a wind tunnel is that it gives you the real behavior of the air, not your perceived model that you apply, which might not be adequate in picking up all the turbulence you have in the system. And so that's the, the interest in using that.
And so that's the, the introduction to, to what we might, what we will do to today for the next two weeks. So the next two weeks is pipe flow. The week after that is uh, external flows. And the week following that is um, uh, open channel flows, which is after uh, the Thanksgiving break. So uh, the schedule from now, two weeks on pipe flow, one week on um, external flows. The week before Thanksgiving uh, is your week to um, upload your presentations. Um, no, no classes, no things to view then. And then the week after Thanksgiving is uh, um, um, open channel flows. And then week 15, which is the last one before exam week, is, is a week to, to prepare for, for that. Okay? So that's where we are going with our, our remaining activities. What do I want? I want this. Okay. So, so yeah, I didn't open this, but this is, uh, you might recognize this if any of you have been to Toronto. This is actually a, a plexiglass model of the CN Tower in downtown Toronto, uh, which was tested in this wind tunnel. Um, and apparently the design changed from something that had three legs on it and was quite gargantuan and a bit clumsy to this very uh, slim, slender, kind of iconic needle, which was ultimately the, the case, which was, I think, built in the, the mid-1970s. Twin towers, in this case, with no buildings around it, nice bow tie. I should wear myself one of those. And, and the other um, wrinkle on this, I realize it's split between figures uh, just from the download, but um, forces on offshore platforms, both from wind forces, which are a big thing. They, platforms get evacuated during hurricanes in the Gulf for obvious reasons, but also looking at uh, wave loadings by loading it uh, the, in a tank because for floating platforms that are cable stayed onto the seabed, uh, the motion of the ocean is something that changes the aspect of the, the rig. And so that movement may have something either positive or negative to add the forces, to add to the forces that the rig sees. And you may want to know things like what are the cable loads that you see due to the combination of wind forces and ocean wave forces so that you design the cables appropriately and anchor them appropriately into the, uh, into the seabed. So. So it's an interesting uh, arrangement. And this is what I think, well, it's a, a sketch of what the tunnel looks like. Okay? So, so that's enough. So, so that's kind of to cement maybe our comments on um, wind tunnels and dimensional analysis. And so I thought what would be useful to do is to maybe go back and spend this period getting into pipe flow, but also kind of give a perspective of where we've come because we've actually come quite a long way. Uh, with this, we're probably two-thirds of our way through the material. Uh, the easier material is about to come because it's recipe-based. Here's a, a pipe network. What do you apply for friction losses here, here, and here? You add them up, and you come to some conclusion as to what those would be. And so um, I think in some respects it's less um, subjective than the stuff that we've, we've done, done so far. And so that's the plan for today. And so we are here, and I guess it, we will talk about pipe flow, but let's uh, talk about a recap on the whole system. Oops. I was trying to remember what the different commands are to be able to draw straight lines. So um, let's go. So if we, if we index things on our weeks here of toil, you know that we talked about uh, flow along streamlines. We know that we used Bernoulli. We know that we defined our behavior both along and across a streamline with velocities applied relative to it. And that Bernoulli just came from, from conservation of momentum. This is momentum. Destruction of rate of change of momentum is, is this term here. And you know that it was something like uh, this. 
So elevation, pressure, and velocity heads, um, upstream and the same downstream, all written in terms of uh, characteristic length, so not dimensionless, but in terms of each of the units of this are, are length. Um, we knew that if we know f five of these parameters, we can solve for the remaining one. For instance, we did the calculation for the uh, trucks being towed behind the, uh, the 747 at San Francisco Airport. Um, we talked about conservation of mass. which I guess in its uh, broadest form was something like uh, the sum of uh, mass flow rates plus rates of change of density and volume equals zero. More often than not, we assumed that these were zero but not always. And if that was the case, then we could use that in its simplest form to write that area times velocity times density, upstream and downstream. Uh, for unchanging densities, they had to be in our case, so those actually dropped out. Uh, we could write it in this form, and we could use that here for the cases where we only had four knowns and we had to constrain it in some other way to solve it. So conservation of mass you can use in a general form in this form in different reference frames and we talked about those reference frames I think ad nauseum um, but in its simplest form it was used to be able to constrain Bernoulli's equation for when you have four, un four knowns and two unknowns this gives you one of those extra knowns. We talked about in week seven conservation of uh, momentum. Which was actually um, the definition of Bernoulli as well. But in a much more um, uh, generic form. And so it's still in terms of these six terms but we could write it for general uh, geometries which weren't impacted. And then, uh, most recently, uh, for conservation of energy. Again, to build on our repertoire, if you like. And so conservation of energy, all that gave us was these extra terms in this. That was, we could accommodate energy inputs into the system through a pump as positive magnitudes or we could take care of uh, energy losses in the system due to something, uh, due to real behavior. And so in all of Bernoulli, even up to this case, uh, always we had assumed um, an inviscid fluid. So the velocity, uh, sorry, the viscosity, dynamic or kinematic, we've only used uh, dynamic, um, was always zero. And that is the strict condition that you use Bernoulli. Bernoulli has to be steady state, uh, static reference frame, uh, inviscid fluid, and an incompressible fluid. But we use it for air, which is compressible, and we use it for uh, air and water, which are both have finite viscosities. Uh, two orders of magnitude apart for their viscosities, but they have finite viscosities, and it works actually reasonably well. But for some problems, the very essence of the problem is in understanding what these individual terms are. How big a pump do you have to apply to suck fluid out of a reservoir, out of the bottom of a borehole, where you have the losses within the well bore uh, that you have to counter by having a pump that pushes against it? You know. The reason you do slick water fracturing, you add um, a friction reducer to the fracturing fluid because you don't eat up all of your energy in pumping it down the well bore. It's nothing to do about once you get into the reservoir. It means you want to apply the pressure that you have at the wellhead uh, and more three kilometers down where you're in the Marcellus and to be able to rip open the rock by, by fracturing it. 
And so the essence of some of the problems that we deal with is this uh, frictional loss, which is only dealt with when we use conservation of energy. And so if we use conservation of energy, uh, probably a little diagram is probably worthwhile doing. Um, if we have this um, flow system going from upstream to downstream, just as before, if we have a pump in it, then I guess if I draw this as a diagram, uh, and you know all this, so it's just a, a matter of going through. So this is along the streamline, I suppose. Um, this might be locations upstream and downstream. And we know that in all of these, you know, if you choose a datum, then all of a sudden this becomes Z1, this becomes Z2, um, some other magnitude becomes, bless you, P1 over unit weight, bless you again, P2 over unit weight, a velocity term in the system, V1 squared over 2G, and an extra term to this point here, which is the pump head maybe that you supply. And we know that from the fact that this equation is an equivalency, that the two sides each, each match each other, so the upstream side and the downstream side match each other, we know that this line across here also has to be an equivalency as well. And so, depending on our system, uh, if the pipe diameter, for instance, doesn't change, we could surmise that because of conservation of mass, the velocities have to be the same, upstream and downstream. And so V1 and V2 have to be the same, so these heads are the same. And uh, this term here now becomes, so this is just a kind of pictorial representation of um, the head loss. And so if we use that, then our thoughts of what this might look like is that this kind of is what we've called um, the energy grade line. So we have pressure added to the system or potential added to the system. Potentials, uh, you know, an amount of energy by raising it up a little bit. If you pull up a, a bottle of water higher, then you raise its potential. And uh, this is eaten up by the pipe losses in going from upstream to downstream. And so that's physically what we're attempting to, to represent. And so as we march through this, all we've done is we've gone from conservation momentum, Newton's second law, Bernoulli's equation, including the inputs into the system, that could be outputs if it's a turbine, and the losses within the system. And we've used that to be able to, to constrain behavior. And so now, I guess importantly, this is the case. Because this is the term that accounts for those head losses. And it's um, a nonlinear term. If I pull something across a bench, friction stops, provides a resistance to me moving it towards me. If I push it back to its previous position, I use the same amount of friction again to get it back there. So twice the amount that I did pulling it towards me. So it's irreversible in a thermodynamic sense. So these losses are always positive losses. You always lose it, you never gain it in this system. And so these are the essence of the behavior that now we'd like to, to look at. So for complicated systems, um, these losses can be evaluated uh, by a variety of different methods. And so the first method that we talked about was uh, a very powerful one. Uh, dimensional analysis. You're off, the off the screen, thank you. Is this on? Yeah, thanks. You didn't need the D. Oh, fine. Okay. Whoops. Just removed that. Thank you. Seems like a strange term to me, considering it's all about non-dimensional variables. 
but nonetheless, that's the, the, the deal. And so you'll remember that what we had to deal with um, was that we could apply what we call similitude in three things. Uh, one was geometric, which just says that uh, the length to diameter of the model has to equal the characteristic dimensions of the prototype. Fancy way of saying that the floating uh, oil rig that we just saw is a scaled down version of the, the true system that we, we deal with. And so that's the first requirement, is that the model has to look like the, the prototype. Uh, kinematic requirement. So kinematic similitude requires that typically the Reynolds number of the model is equivalent to the Reynolds number of the prototype. And I'm pretty sure that the example that we gave of that was if you look at um, flow around a disk, um, I'll do two disks or a cylinder, von Karman vortex sheets, is that if you have a flow at very low Reynolds numbers, the flow regime looks exactly like this. It hugs the system, uh, gives very, if you look at the velocity profile um, relative to this, then the velocity profile looks like this. So this is Reynolds number um, less than a thousand, say. And if you look at much higher Reynolds numbers, then the system you have has all these eddies that come off the back side of it. In, in terms of individual vortices that get shed, these are the things on the Tacoma Narrows. There it comes across the, the deck. Uh, you could think of the deck as a cylinder, upstream, downstream. A, a, an eddy gets shed off the top, then the bottom, then the top, just as these. And in doing that, it gives this impetus that puts it in some kind of uh, motion and if that motion happens to be the same as the uh, the resonance of the structure then it starts um, uh, vibrating and pulls itself apart and so the velocity field if you look at this uh, would look something like this whoops I didn't mean to do that So instead of being, they might not look very different to you, make it, let's, let me make it look very different. So in other words, it might look like this. So there's a boundary layer here, very thin. All the frictional losses occur on that, as opposed to a very wide boundary layer here. And so the analogy that's always given is the dimpling on a golf ball. Why is a golf ball dimpled? Because it makes it turbulent at high rent, it, at any given Reynolds number, it brings the onset of turbulence, say, greater than 3,000. It makes it turbulent, and the flow regime is like this with a very thin boundary layer, which happens to be very effective at not dissipating too much energy in the system. And so, so that's the second requirement for this. Reynolds number, you'll remember, is just the ratio of uh, inertial to viscous forces. Inertial is V squared over 2G, and viscous, well, we don't have an equivalent parameter for that, but it's just density, flow velocity, a characteristic dimension, which for pipe flow is usually the diameter of the pipe, and viscosity. And so we want to have similitude in geometrically and kinematically, and if we satisfy that, then we can use dynamic similitude to kind of close the circle. And dynamic similitude is that the Euler number of the model is equal to the Euler number of the prototype. Um, which I suppose, uh, if you're looking at a structure, 
and you want to know what the force is that's applied due to the pressures that are on those two systems. Then Euler number is just um, pressure divided by density and velocity squared. This is kind of, this is um, the ratio of the pressure term, if you like. It's the ratio of this term and this term. We derived it maybe the first time we met or the second time we met. Uh, and pressure is equal to force over area this term, rho v squared. And so if you wanted to know the pressure on a building or the force on a building, um, then we could measure the force in the model, which would give us this, and then that would allow us to solve for this. So the, the idea, I think, is basically this. You run an experiment with your model. You do your experiment at a velocity which is low and a velocity which is high and you end up with some numbers for the Euler numbers, the forces that are on those structures. So you can calculate what the Euler number is for each of those conditions on the model. And then so if you now know for your particular uh, structure if you look at the Reynolds number for the prototype in its working environment, you know that you hit the line here, and so you know that this is therefore the Euler number for the prototype. Because these numbers had all been done for the model, but just different flow velocities. You might use different fluids as well, not liquids. Uh, you could use gases or liquids, so long as uh, you have the same regime. So the idea is that this is the right flow regime, it looks, the model looks like the model scaled down in every aspect. The flow regime looks like the flow regime scaled down in every aspect. So if you look at the model and if you look at the prototype from a distance, they look identical to it, each other. They'd be self-similar. And then you can convert between the forces. And so that's where we're, we're going with that. And so, yeah, and so that's basically week nine. So this is nine. So I guess we've been through this magic carpet ride from week four through to, to week nine. Um, so the preamble then for week 10 uh, is for pipe flow. Am I off again? Barely. Yeah. Is that on? Thanks. I guess if I was smart, I'd leave the... Um, this on. That takes up too much space. So, what did I do? All right. So, all right, back again. I have to say, I like red for some reason. So here's the big picture then for what we'll deal with. And maybe uh, what I'll do, if we're still on, um, I will start dividing this into three lines for our three areas. I'm actually thinking about... So this is, again, the big picture view of what now we want to do. So in week... Uh, so 10 and 11, we'll do pipe flow. And the main point is, from what we've talked about, is that really all we're doing is the energy equation 1D is just Bernoulli equation with the pump term in it and the head loss term in it that accounts for these important additions into the system or subtractions from the system if you're using a system as a turbine. Um, and also the frictional losses, which again are the essence of the system pulling fluids up a wellbore. Or if you're dealing with porous media flow, pushing stuff through little capillary tubes you can think of as a bundle of little tubes in a porous medium that represents flow in the subsurface for contaminant hydrology or for recovering fluid from a petroleum reservoir or from a geothermal reservoir. It, it all links to the same thing. And so 
the analog that we'll use for pipe flow is exactly this, that we want to have flow in a pipe. Um, we can define the characteristics of this flow as being a pressure drop as we go along the pipe, so delta P. Um, the pipe has some length. The pipe has some uh, diameter. And we'll, you'll see these quantities many times. Uh, there's a flow rate through the pipe, which is some velocity, which we can also give as a flow rate Q, which is just velocity times area, right? We know that. Um, the true characteristics of the pipe is that pipes often have some kind of roughness attached to them. So if you're flowing down a stainless steel pipe or a cast iron pipe or a concrete pipe, then this roughness has some impact, you could imagine, on how easily the flow occurs past them. Uh, and actually the biggest part is that it makes this transition for laminar flow to turbulent flow earlier, the rougher it is. Um, and that we have a fluid going along it which has some density and some viscosity, I guess, are the, are the parameters. So those are the parameters that describe our system. So if you look at our controls in terms of similitude, this is actually a bit more of a, a blunt object than I want. So geometric similitude requires that the length to diameter ratio and, for instance, the roughness to diameter ratio are the same between um, model and prototype. I won't write this out for everyone. But this is the idea, is that if we do some analysis, we'd like that to be the case. I've probably gone off, but this says geometric on this side. I'll, I'll step in now. Um, we talked about kinematic similitude. And so, in other words, Reynolds number model equals Reynolds number prototype. And Reynolds number is density of velocity, average velocity, and a length dimension relative to viscosity. And we'd want, if that's the case, then we get Euler number equivalency, which is EU uh, model equals Euler number of the prototype, and those are defined as the pressure drop, in this case delta P, over rho V squared. And I guess I left one parameter out in this, and that is when we talk, we've been talking about conservation of momentum, you can imagine uh, that if you take it's much more apparent if we look at external flows, but you can imagine that if water is flowing down this pipe and it's scraping along the pipe to create a friction, a drag on the inside, then we have to physically hold it there to stop it from moving. If we don't stop it from moving, then the pipe on its own somehow would actually just move with the flow to try and make that friction magnitude zero. It would satisfy Newton's second law, and it would basically be going at the same velocity as the flow within the pipe. And so if the pipe is to be static, then there's going to be a force that's applied on the interior. And so um, this pressure drop, which is here, we could imagine as being, if we take the uh, change in pressure and we multiply it by the cross-sectional area of the pipe, and if the pressure here is zero, so delta P represents that pressure change, then this will basically represent the force we have to apply to hold that pipe in place. And so that's the essence of what we want to know. This is what we'll call the friction, frictional resistance to flow. And that allows you to prescribe how big a pump you want to apply to your system. So if we look at um, external flows, And we might want to look at a nice turbine blade or something, but let's not. Let's look at 
an obvious geometry now which is exactly the same as a pipe flow except the difference is that this pipe is capped off both ends and so by definition the flow that comes along here will do this and again you could imagine that to keep a bit more obvious if you have something flowing against you you have to push to be able to act against that then this is acting in two ways it's acting because it's got this stagnation pressure on the upstream side actually exactly the same as this that's different from the downstream side same as the the truck being pulled behind the uh, the 747 at SFO uh, and also you can imagine that you might have viscous frictional losses on the edges and so when we talk about external flows again we'll talk about the force you have to apply to keep something in place it's the drag on an airplane which is different from the lift on a wing which is perpendicular to the direction of flow and we have to satisfy the same requirements they would be length over diameter and they would be some roughness divided by diameter for the idea of a golf ball which we talked about kinematic would be the same as well which would be Reynolds numbers are equivalent same characteristic typically it would be this global characteristic dimension of diameter that we'd use as our appropriate characteristic dimension viscosities and densities of the fluids um, the velocity of the fluid on the outside would be the other term that would go into this. So rho V D over mu. And if we do that, then we think that the Euler numbers should be equivalent as well. So, whoops, oh, I can do it there because it's not off screen. And this is just that delta P over rho V squared. Rho V squared is just half V squared over 2G, written in a different way, uh, which we could also write as being a force over an area times Rho V squared. And so if we measure in the model what the force is, you have to keep this play thing in place or the moment, then you can scale it up to represent the other case. So that's, again, a little bit similar. So there's absolute equivalency in these, and the equations we use will be identical. And so finally, um, in 13, I guess we're not actually going to get as far as we want, but I think this is useful to do this. Uh, we'll do open channel flows. Uh, and again, we could use the same um, idea of what this system would look like. So you have a pipe uh, that goes between upstream and downstream. But importantly, this pipe now is only partway full. And also importantly is that if we look at the datum as we go along here then oops, the essence of what we're talking about is that uh, there's an elevation drop along the length of this in other words it's going downhill and so now certainly within this fluid that's flowing in the pipe. It can't be a gas, right, because a gas would take up the whole pipe. Uh, but this is a fluid that's flowing in the pipe. Uh, delta P is irrelevant because if you apply delta P upstream, then it will just bypass the fluid and go in the air. And so you can't maintain a big pressure differential between the upstream and downstream. All of the, th the forces driving the flow are due to gravity. If it's horizontal, it's a pond. If it's sloping, then you can imagine it will flow. And we have the same requirements as before. 
Um, they're slightly different. Uh, certainly it will be length over diameter. Um, uh, maybe roughness will be important. This can still be a diameter of the pipe, of course. Uh, it turns out that this is irrelevant because flow is always turbulent. And it's turbulent because this diameter constraint is always large. Big, it's not a, a pipe or a capillary, it's a, a river or a ditch that's meters wide. Um, so in other words, Reynolds number is typically much greater than 2,000, which we'll find out. And therefore, it's almost always turbulent. And so this doesn't matter anymore, as we'll find out. And again, uh, we can look at kinematic behavior, that the Reynolds number uh, of the model is e equal, is, e well, it doesn't need to be equal to it, which is much greater than 2,000. Not 200, but 2,000. And if that's the case, then Reynolds number doesn't matter anymore, as we'll find out. We don't know that yet. And if that's the case, then again, we can use Euler number, kind of, um, to get pressures. Euler number is a pressure divided by rho v squared, which is a force. Um, but also, what we'll rely on is a different number, which we don't need to worry about now, called the Froude number or Froude number. We've used it already when we talked about uh, velocities of uh, the celerity wave, tsunamis, maybe in class number three or two, um, where z is the depth of flow, g is gravity, and velocity is the velocity of flow. And so these, the fruit number, actually in these cases, uh, defines the, the behavior of the system. And so if we go back, so we're really doing this. So all we're doing in pipe flow, all the equations that define pipe flow that came from the 1800s were done by running experiments, run on different pipes, uh, different roughnesses, different flow velocities, different fluids, and being able to construct relationships between Reynolds numbers and Euler numbers. Um, and by looking at the data, defining what the important controlling terms are. Nothing more than that. And so that's where all the, the background from that has come. It basically uses the Bernoulli equation with the energy terms added into it in what we'll want to do. And so those additional terms are for putting pump heads into the system and for looking at friction losses that occur due to viscous drag uh, on the surface of the pipes and also uh, pressure drag as well from the air hitting your chest or the, the vehicle being pulled behind the jet airplane. Uh, they're, and they're, they're very similar. So there's similarities between all of these. And so what we'll find out is that um, the relationships that we develop will all use this one-dimensional energy equation and all that will differ in, is in how we figure out exactly what these loss terms are. And that's what our um, effort is, is going to be. So that's kind of uh, it. Well, actually, we have five minutes um, just to, do, to go to something else. So, um, yeah, okay. So we've done this. We've talked about internal and external flows. Um, we've talked about how it links with the Bernoulli equation and the energy equation. They're equivalent just with the loss terms. And that the essence of these flows are the frictional losses. That's what we'd like to be able to figure out. And um, maybe it's worthwhile uh, just summarizing these effects as you see them here. Um, we've made the case not only that pipe flow and open channel flow are the same, but different. Uh, but also the external flows are as well. The essence of the behavior is the viscous loss. Roughness affects the behavior. And it's this transition from lambda to turbulent that affects results. And so to be able to figure out exactly what these head losses are, 
what we'll find out is that for uh, pipe flows, these head losses are equal to what we'll refer to as a friction factor, length over diameter, and the inertial term. And for flows around elbows, for instance, and fittings, can't do it. They will be something that looks like a coefficient, which you measure in the fitting and just apply to the system. And so this is the, the basis of what we'll deal with. Uh, as we start talking about pipe flow. And so if we just go back maybe to Utube and look at this again, then the, the point we're making is that to be able to understand the systems, we can do experiments on the right pipe geometry with the right pipe uh, roughness, because those are the ones that give us geometric similitude. We do it at the right Reynolds number, and here velocity is increasing, and so for the same fluid, Reynolds number is increasing, and so the, the geometry of the flow, if you like, is changing, the aspect of the flow is changing, and that if we take uh, measurements of the upstream pressure to the downstream pressure at any particular Reynolds number, that gives us a pressure drop which we can convert into an Euler number, and that Euler number is exactly what we would use to be able to say about what this friction loss parameter is that we'd like to know. And so that's the, the mechanism. And so now it becomes a recipe in terms of what are these numbers for different sized pipes, different shape pipes, different type pipes, different fittings, and how do we use them to solve for the various classes of problems we'd like to know. What is the pressure drop within a system if we have a given velocity? To get that velocity, what kind of pump power do we need to put into the system? Uh, if we want to get flow from A to B and we haven't designed the piping, a slightly more difficult problem is designing what the diameters and lengths of the pipes should be. Well, the length might be prescribed, but what are the diameters that you would use that would allow you to size a pump to get the right delivery of fluid in the system? Uh, and that becomes more complicated because you have to iterate on the solution because the, um, the friction factors are vary as a function of the flow velocity you have. So if you have a thin pipe to get the given flow rate, you'd have to have a very high flow velocity because of a short cross-section. Uh, and therefore, by dimensioning the pipe and changing the pipe size, to get the same flow rate, you change the velocity. And so it becomes a nonlinear problem. So that's our task for the next, uh, I guess, week and a half.